It is time for an investigation and a repair, unfortunately, on a brand new product from Temu, but uh, this one is actually faulty, and I'll show you the fault. It's a body induction lamp, people to the bright, people go out. That makes perfect sense. I've looked at one of these before, but the circuitry is completely different in this one. It's kind of evolved. So you get some instructions, you get a little tiny charging cable, and you get a couple of magnetic, well, this one's magnetic. This is just a piece of steel with a adhesive tape, and you stick it onto your wall or ceiling and stick this onto the back of this, and then you can just basically stick it to whatever you want. And it's got the pass and fred detector. You can operate it in two modes. You can have it in passive and fred mode with a dusk sensor. You'll see it go out shortly because it is going to detect it is uh, bright. And you've also got the continuous on mode just for use as a sort of flashlight, I guess. Let's undo this and put it in charge and I'll show you what's going on. It also, incidentally, I have had this open. Uh, it came with this tiny little 250 milliamp hour cell. It's now got a 600 milliamp hour cell on it. It's uh, an easy modification to make and uh, it increases its usefulness greatly because it makes it last a lot longer between charges. So here is a power bank and a Ruedang meter. And if I plug this in, you'll see the red charging LED lights, but it's only displaying two or three milliamps. And no matter how long you leave it, it only displays two or three milliamps, and the battery does not take a charge. It turns out the fault was very straightforward. I should just put this stuff out the way and pop the lid so you can see inside. Here is the Isisamo. So there are distinct positions for the clips. There's four clips around the lid. Uh, the distinct positions are uh, marked by a slight patterning on the plastic where they've used the uh, injection mould type system to allow for little indents for the clips. So this comes off and reveals the circuit board inside. It's held in by two screws. I'll take it all the way out. And I'll show you the cell that I've put in the back. So I'll take these two screws out to release the board because it's such a tight fit. You have to just nudge the little plastic slider bit of the switch out, and at that point you can hinge it up and take the circuit board out. There is the much bigger cell that I put in the back. There's the original, there's the big one. It's better. And it just goes on to these pads. The original just had these uh, little tabs folded round and soldered directly onto these. Right, well, tell you what, since I've already taken a picture, I shall show you the picture. And you can uh, see if you can spot the fault. And it was quite an odd one. Unexpected. I was looking for missing components or solder joints, and no, it wasn't that. So I'll uh, zoom out a bit to fit this in. Mm, quite a bit to fit this in. Yeah. And I'll also show you the schematic in a moment. So here's the USB port, there's the LTH7 type charging chip, and uh, because this is a single-sided board, they and because it's got this circle of LEDs, they've taken some quite long routes. For instance, the positive here of the battery feeds the circuitry, it's got a track comes round here, and it splits at this point and goes to the switch that feeds the circuitry in the two modes, but it also goes round uh, to the charging circuit. When I test the charging circuit, everything seemed in place over here, and I was just following that track around, and that's the fault there. See that little divot out the circuit board? They've literally cracked the tip of the surface of the circuit board, and that is where this, the track actually splits two ways. One way goes to power the circuitry, which means the circuitry still works, but the other way is the charge track. So if I scrub that, with a sharp thing, let's use this screwdriver. I'll try and do an in, in situ repair here. I could have done it in the unit. But I'm going to clean both sides of the track there, of that little divot that's missing, and then just bridge over it with solder. That looks promising. I shall zoom down for this.
and I'll get the soda. I've got a little dot of soda here. And I shall put some on here. And here, and then I'll just flow it across so it just bridges. Maybe I'll flow it across. Sometimes it doesn't want to bridge, because that is quite a big gap. If it comes to it, I can always uh, use a bit of wire. I think that's more or less bridged. I'm probably lying. It's probably not more or less bridged. No, it's not. Oh, there it is now. It's bridged. Right, tell you what. Let's bring in the tester again. And then I'll give you a walk through in that circuit. I'll zoom out a bit because this is just a wee bit too close. Here's the Ruedang tester. Uh, now I just need to find that cable. Where's the cable? There it is. So if that is bridged, then the current should be the normal charge current. I don't think it's terribly high because it's a quite a high value of uh, charge control resistor. Uh, 245 milliamps, that is now charging the lithium cell. It is fixed. You see, to you and me, who are comfortable opening things up and looking for faults, that's something that it's no no great deal. You know, we get a faulty product, we fix it. But to anybody else, non-technical, they'd have bought this, they'd have used it, the light would have gone dim, they'd put it in charge, they'd just leave it and say, oh, it just never charges, then it'd go in the bin, wouldn't it? That's what happens. That can get built back in now. Right, back to the... Uh, circuitry here, and I shall zoom back out again for this. I shall turn the solder iron back off. It's making humming noise in the background because it's got a transformer in it. So this is interesting. I don't know if this is a standard microcontroller or a dedicated one because the previous circuitry was a dedicated passer infrared chip, but this time they've uh, gone sort of for something a bit more sophisticated. And uh, that's cut the number of components down. But that also means that this uh, probably has uh, a sort of built-in filtering and a sort of distinctive pulse out to actually trigger this. So we've got the USB charging port. We've got the charge LED. We've got the little controller that controls the charge and then charges the cell. When you click the switch, it goes to one of two positions. One feeds the circuitry directly, and the other feeds it via this diode, so it can actually monitor via an extra pin that uh, the switch is in a different position. Um, there's a light sensor here with a matching one meg ohm resistor to form a potential divider. You can tweak the value of this if you want to actually make it uh, perhaps less sensitive to light or more sensitive to light. And then there's a 3.6 ohm resistor in series with all the LEDs. I've got some statistics and data for you as well here. Here's the schematic. Let me walk you through it. I shall zoom down just a little bit more. Let's see if I can zoom in far too much, as I sometimes do. So here's the USB connection. It's got a little decoupling capacitor across it. There's the LTH7R. Uh, charge control chip, it's got the red LED to show it is charging, and it's got a 4K7 resistor that's set the 250 milliamp. If that was a 220K resistor, you could change it now, uh, 220K, 2.2K, uh, it would be 500 milliamps. But this is a good value because it keeps everything cool and uh, it slowly charges the cell. It's not really, it doesn't need to be that fast. There's the miserable 250 milliamp hour cell. That's probably why they chose the 250 milliamps, because uh, that's sort of 1C. Basically, it's going to charge in roughly an hour, or have most of it's charged in an hour. Then there's the uh, three-way switch. It's got the off position, it's got the pass infrared, and it's got the just the continuous on position. In the pass infrared position, it just powers the main circuitry completely. Let me draw in the missing dots here. Um, the microcontroller seems to have the ability to switch power via this 1K resistor to the passive infrared detector. I thought that might be a built-in regulator in this chip, but I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure, I'm suspicious this is just a microcontroller, and that the two pins that are bridged together on it um, are possibly just digital outputs, that they've just bridged them in parallel so they can switch higher current through the LEDs, as it is. Um, 
At 4.2 volts, it's roughly 50 milliamps through the LEDs. When it's down at 3.2 volts, just before it cuts out, it's 9 milliamps and quite dim. And the crescent current at 4.2 volts is 45 microamps, uh, but it drops progressively as the, uh, the cell voltage gets lower. Um, there is the dusk sensor that uh, forms a potential divider with this one megohm resistor. Now, that could either be an analog input or it could actually just be a buffer digital input and uh, just detecting a fixed transition. And it, given that they've chosen such a standard value here, it may be just saying just dark or light. They're not really, uh, it's not, shall we say, a calibrated value. Um, the other mode here, if you switch it just to the on mode, it powers that rail, but via the Schottky diode. And the reason it does it via the diode is because it also controls an input pin. So the microcontroller or whatever it is knows that it's just in static mode. And all it will do then is it will drive the LEDs on uh, without bothering to look at the pass and thread. Maybe it'll even turn the power off to the pass and thread, but I don't think it does. I don't know why uh, that's uh, got a separate control pin for that. Maybe it's just because they could. I'm not sure. Maybe... Oh, no, because it's not going to go into super standby. If you turn it off, it really does go completely off. It's not like it's going to turn the passive and thread detector off um, unless it could. But if it did turn it off to save power, then it would need to turn it on every so often and let it stabilize. No, that's not. they're not going to do that. But that is it. Uh, it's hackable. There's various things you can do with it. Um, if you want to change the intensity of the LEDs, it's the 3.3 ohm resistor. Um, if you want to upgrade the cell, it's a, it's an easy one to do. Just if you have a spare cell, just make sure it's well insulated and run some wires over to these terminals. I'm trying to think if there's anything else worth mentioning about this. Oh yes, there is. Um, it's got this diffuser over the front. I've got another one of these that I use from the past and uh, it's much better with this diffuser just removed and just the bare circuit board visible because it puts out a lot more light but there we have it the Timu uh, passive infrared sensing movement detector that just basically adds a splash of light they're very useful lights I use various versions of these dotted around the house just so at night time I don't need to turn lights on as if I walk through the house the path is lit as I walk um, but they're very neat very useful little things and definitely fantastic in the event of a power cut uh, the, because uh, wherever you go in the house, it just lights up. But very neat little units. Uh, cheap because they're mass produced. They have gone one step further. I've got another unit from Timu of the wee peek inside and the one chip has 10 pins and it also does the charging. But we'll feature that in a separate video. But that's it. Very hackable, nice little units.